Welcome, distinguished University of Maryland guests. Thank you for be being here with us today. And let me be the first to welcome our distinguished speaker, Under Secretary of State Tara D. Sonnenschein. Uh, before we begin today, I would just ask you to please turn off your cell phones or turn them on to silent. Uh, my name is Bill Braniff, and I'm honored to provide a few opening remarks for today's event as the Executive Director of the Stark Consortium, a DHS Center of Excellence based here in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences at the University of Maryland. As many of you know, Stark is an interdisciplinary research center at the forefront of a very young field of inquiry. We study the human causes and consequences of terrorism to include counterterrorism and community resilience. We gather data and strive to help generate and convey new knowledge about a political phenomenon that in the scheme of things rarely happens, but that generates such an oversized impact when it does occur. All the while, however, through the relationships with practitioners that we have cultivated over the last eight years, we realize that while we have the luxury to sit back, others are navigating that intellectual terrain in the real world, trying to create policy and to implement practice that will mitigate the frequency and lethality of terrorist campaigns of violence over time. So it is with humility that I will introduce the head of public diplomacy and public affairs, whose portfolio includes countering violent extremism internationally. But before I introduce the undersecretary, I would like to provide a bookend for her comments by describing the domestic half of the government's efforts to counter violent extremism. In two policy documents authored by the Obama administration, the US government is turning the page on the post 9-11 story. The years following that attack, of course, were marked with an urgency to understand the threat, a threat that caught us by surprise and elicited a multitude of reactions in various arenas. We passed legislation to change our domestic intelligence and law enforcement paradigm from reactive to proactive. We engaged in expeditionary military action in two countries, and we engaged in a portfolio of clandestine activities domestically and abroad, some of which have since been curtailed and some which persist. Sustaining this forward-leaning posture indefinitely carried risks of its own, however, such as unintentionally othering the Muslim minority communities in the United States, thereby, thereby reducing levels of social cohesion and trust, or in the worst case, occasionally providing fodder for Al-Qaeda's propaganda narrative about the, the purported war on Islam. For these reasons, among others, counterterrorism as a term was put into the background. And a community-first approach called Countering Violent Extremism, or CVE, was issued forth. The White House strategy document describing this new approach was first criticized for lacking enough detail in implementation. A second criticism of the strategy was that it suffered from an overdose of political correctness. I would argue that these criticisms were born of misunderstanding, as the document was intended to be a strategic communications tool, first and foremost. The administration re uh, recognized the implication of a truism taught in every Terrorism 101 class. Terrorism is inherently political behavior. It is about changing or maintaining the organizing principles of a society through illegal violence. And so if terrorism is inherently political, what must counterterrorism be? Counterterrorism strategy is not merely a choice between a law enforcement approach or a military approach. To change the conversation at the start of the decade after the decade after 9-11, a more expansive concept was needed that would recognize the political dimension of counterterrorism. The White House strategy doc document therefore struck several, several chords. We will safeguard communities from all forms of predation to include but not limited to radicalization. We will work with communities to protect them from radicalizers. We understand that the government must earn legitimacy in the eyes of its constituents by being inclusive, addressing grievances, fostering dialogue, and protecting civil liberties and in turn, that constituents must play a lead role in providing positive alternatives to violent activism and undermining both the message and the messengers of violent ideologies. A second White House document began to discuss implementation, assigning responsibilities across a multitude of government agencies and departments, none of which own CVE, but all of which must play a part. In the most conceptual terms, CVE efforts at home must recognize four components of violent extremism and then address each of those components in turn. The four components are grievance, cognitive opening, violent ideology, and mobilization. To tell the simplest version of the story, I feel aggrieved. So my mind is now open to explanations for my troubles and for insights on how to address them. That opening is filled by a militant argument, 
And when I socialize that set of ideas with others online or in person, we may begin to mobilize for violence. The effectiveness of domestic CVE going forward will be a function of how well federal, state, and local government, governments marshal their collective resources to provide good governance to obviate and address grievances, foster communities that provide positive pathways for individuals seeking answers, foster communities that undermine the legitimacy of violent ideologues and their ideologies, and then disrupt those few who manage to mobilize for violence using the counterterrorism tools we have honed over the last decade and in partnerships with communities. Implementation, of course, is where this gets tricky. Right now, across the country, U.S. attorneys are using their convening authority to, fe to get federal, state, and local resources on the same page with community leaders. DHS is generating training curricula for state and local law enforcement and funding research at places like START to understand how communities perceive their own risks of violent extremism and to develop training for risk communicators, among other efforts. The government is also educating community leaders on topics like online radicalization so communities can help protect their own. 18,000 law enforcement organizations are seeking training to develop, to develop more effective community-oriented policing methods, and local governments are grappling with issues of community resilience. CVE at home is a complicated and decentralized business. What many of us understand in a globalized world, however, is that CVE cannot be just at home to be effective. And for that reason, I'm very happy to turn the floor over to hear about the other side of CVE. Tara D. Sonnenschein was sworn in as Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs on April 5th, 2012. Tara was formerly Executive Vice President of the United States Institute of Peace. Prior to joining the U.S. Institute of Peace, she was a Strategic Communications Advisor to many international organizations, including the USIP, the International Crisis Group, Internews, CARE, the American Academy of Diplomacy, and the International Women's Media Foundation. Under Secretary Sonnenschein served in various capacities in the White House during the Clinton administration, including Transition Director and Director of Foreign Policy Planning for the National Security Council, and Special Assistant to the President and Deputy Director of Communications for the NSC. Tara graduated from Tufts in 1981, Phi Beta Kappa with a BA in Political Science. She has remained active at Tufts on boards and advisory committees, including the Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service. Her broadcast career began at ABC News in New York, and she went on to become editorial producer of ABC's News Nightline, where she worked for more than a decade. She was also an off-air reporter at the Pentagon for ABC's World News Tonight. She's a recipient of 10 News Emmy Awards and other awards in journalism for broadcast programs on domestic and international issues. A former contributing editor for Newsweek, she's the author of numerous articles on foreign affairs published in the New York Times, Washington Post, and other newspapers. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming Under Secretary of State Sonnenschein. Thank you, Bill, very much for that warm introduction. And let me, before I formally welcome all of you, just highlight a few old colleagues who are here Shibley Talami and Dick Brecht. Um, Old, they're not old in years. I've just known them both a very long time. So it's wonderful that they're here. But thank you to you, the students and the scholars, CVE and CT practitioners, and I hope future practitioners. It's really a pleasure to be with you. I want to begin by asking you to join me in applauding START, which is such a great start and also applauding all your sports victories, which I also follow. So congratulations. I am here to talk to you about the challenges of countering violent extremism and where public diplomacy fits in the picture. Now, I want to warn you up front that this is not one of my shortest speeches. However, I think it's one of my most important speeches. And I'm going to ask you if you can pretend you have seatbelts to buckle them up. Because um, I'm going to take you a little bit on a ride. And I want to take you inside the space where public diplomacy and CVE operate. And I want to take you a little bit behind the scenes. So I'm going to tell you about what we do and how we measure what it is we do. 
But to begin, I want to get you in a creative thinking mode. Any of you already in a creative thinking mode? Yes, a couple of creative thinkers. I want to remind you of something that my children played with, and sometimes even though they're teenagers still do, and maybe some of you remember Legos. Anybody remember Legos? Those little toy building blocks that fired the imagination of children for generations. And it's something about Legos. You take all this time and care and creativity and patience as you go through this construction process and you build a Lego skyscraper. And then if you have two boys, as I do, sometimes it takes about a second for the Lego skyscraper to be destroyed. It's fast and it's over. As America and the rest of the world have been seeing so tragically, destruction is quick sometimes and it's often the end game of the terrorist. Construction, building, let's say, the infrastructure of a society, that takes some work, some time, because you're trying to build what I think of as an alternative scenario to violent extremism. That building of an alternative scenario is the brick and mortar of public diplomacy. Now, you might say that the adversary, the one who destroys, has the advantage. I mean, destruction is pretty easy to achieve, and it's ruthlessly effective. And in many places around the world where people lack certain things, like opportunity, or have, as Bill mentioned, local grievances that go unchecked, well, then rec recruitment of the destroyer is pretty easy. But what I'm here to explain to you is how often positive work offsets a negative environment. This building capacity that you hear a lot about, these forging of partnerships and finding resources, is all about engaging actors in a way that wires them in a more connective community approach. First, you have to ask, is it, is it really worth it to try to build these positive environments I mean, are we really going to work with nations and citizens and partners in their efforts? Are we really going to build peaceful, prosperous, and tolerant societies? That brings me to what I do, and many others increasingly around the world believe in, which is the impact of public diplomacy to the outcome of global engagements. Now, I want to make sure we're on the same page here. How many of you think you know what public diplomacy even is? The, the people who went like this are very smart because it sometimes goes like this. But in short, public diplomacy, and here's where you can take out your pens or your computers, Public diplomacy is how we engage with people around the world and engage to both explain our values and our interests, yes, to build mutual understanding, but I would add to provide some connective tissue, to connect them in ways that improve their lives, that advance their human rights that advance religious tolerance and certain freedoms that we think ultimately could be guaranteed by constitutions protected by government practice, rule of law, 
and vibrant civil societies. So it's about this engagement to advance opportunity. And because I see so many women and girls here, I would just add that part of the work we do is making more accessible opportunities for women and girls. So yes, we do come at it believing that free, fair, and transparent environments support people like emerging entrepreneurs, those disadvantaged, those who don't have access to the internet or to information that might just unlock their potential. So now you're thinking, okay, we have to advance a positive and work against a negative and do this all in an environment that might be an environment of fear, hatred, and intolerance. We might be working in an environment of ruthless repression, of top-down tyranny, of indiscriminate violence targeting innocent civilians. It's getting complex. I don't mind complexity. I hope you don't, because this stuff is complicated. You have lots of factors going at once. Some lack of economic, social, political opportunity. And you have this appeal of an extremist narrative. So how are you going to approach this? Well, the way we approach it is with a big toolbox. Lots of tools in our public diplomacy toolbox. We could try some educational exchanges. We could work through social media. We might try interfaith dialogue or a leadership project or a professional exchange or a vocational training. Or we might just take out of our toolbox some music, some media, some culture, some sports, some art. Yep, they're all part of the toolbox. Even, by the way, we might use the power of video games. We have a video game that um, we've put online now. It's called Trace Effects. And it's a video game that teaches the English language. How would the English language training fit into this? We'll come back to that. How about online? How many of you are online on a, I was going to say daily, but maybe I'll ask hourly basis? <laughs> yes, we have certainly realized the power of online engagement. And so we now have a center that is focused on online engagement. It is the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications. And it works with other agency partners, including the military, and with our embassies abroad, to do what? I would sum it up by saying to address the upstream factors of radicalization. The upstream factors of radicalization. All right, well, let's get concrete now. Who are we worried about? Who are we worried about? Well, I know some of you have heard of Al-Qaeda. Some of you have heard of Osama bin Laden. And you might be wondering what we are doing about them. Well, I think we took care of, you probably know about the bin Laden ending. But what about the Al-Qaeda story? It's important for me to say to you that although Al-Qaeda's central operating command capacity has diminished, there are still splinter groups and individual adherents and advocates who are still inspired by a destructive cause and actually quite eager to cause trouble. So thanks to our own and our collective efforts, which includes working with friends and allies, Al-Qaeda is finding it harder to raise money 
train recruits, and plan attacks outside its regions. The leadership is diminished, but the challenges do remain. In the Sahel, the Maghreb, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Horn of Africa, where groups are continuing to use terror to advance an agenda and to extend reach and networks in multiple directions. So it is not just central Al-Qaeda that we worry about. We worry about their franchises, Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram. Those that exploit negative factors with the express purpose of recruiting people, and often very young people, for violent extremism. So we look to partners for help. Partners could be other governments, they could be scholars, could be religious scholars, universities, even ordinary citizens to help build some coalitions to counter this violent extremism. We have the Global Counterterrorism Forum, which you might look up. It's supported by about 29 countries, plus the European Union, and that's helping to strengthen civil societies and CVE work. What does that really mean? It means you build rule of law, frameworks. You might combat kidnapping for ransom, enforce border security, and take other countermeasures to confront violent extremists. We also have a new international center of excellence that we are working with partners overseas in Abu Dhabi, and it's called Hedaya. Anyone know what the word Hedaya means? You'll have to stay behind and ask Shibley. Hedaya draws from collective expertise and experience for training, dialogue, research, and collaboration. Okay, so I told you who some of the violent extremists are. Where are they today? Where are they this morning? Where are they at 11.30 right now? Some, some are online. Others are in more traditional spaces. So we have to actually cover a full spectrum going all the way from online activity to more traditional spaces, both virtual and non-virtual. Well, what are we gonna actually do when we get there? What am I gonna do when I get online and I meet violent extremists? Well, a couple of things. We might try delegitimizing the ideology. We might try some messaging tools. We might try to engage with change agents. We might start at the direct engagement and the digital and maybe work both. So while we're working in traditional spaces, we're also engaging in social media, blogs, and online forums. So if I were still a journalist, I'm a recovering journalist, and I was trying to write the headline of this speech, this is what I would say it would be. We cannot afford to stand on the sidelines and let cynical voices distort and misreport our policies our values, and our interests. We have to enter the communication space where so many young people are getting their information. And we have to contest extremist and other negative rhetoric with facts and counter assertions. I'm proud that President Obama signed an executive order in September 2011 to establish a center for strategic counterterrorism communications. 
It is Executive Order 13584. It is housed within my department, and it collaborates with embassies and consulates, interagency and international partners to counter terrorist narratives and misinformation. We're entering spaces where Al-Qaeda lurks and its supporters, and we're engaging them on chat forums. And by the way, to do that, you can't always use that English language I was telling you about. So you need to be studying up on your Arabic, Somali, Punjabi, and Urdu. All of you speak all of those I know fluently. Well, how, how many engagements have we had since the President issued that executive order, which was only in September 2011? We've engaged more than 7,000 engagements. What's an engagement online look like? Well, it could be a written text posted to Facebook or other forums, or we might go to the comment section. Anyone ever go to the comment section of websites? A lot happens in the comment section of websites. So we are targeting the hardliners. But you know what? We're kind of realistic. We've got to be kind of realistic. Are we really going to reach hardliners and change their minds and behavior? What if we just reach middle grounders, fence sitters, sympathizers, and passive supporters? What if we just counter some unfounded rumors or some propaganda or some conspiracy theory with facts truth and reasonable arguments? What if we just define what we're doing, who we are? Maybe we'll have just a greater chance of changing more minds. So I want us to be realistic. We can post videos also on YouTube. And I'm going to show you one of those videos shortly. So now you can't leave because there's a video coming. The video is called Betrayal. Now, let me warn you up front. It is not a high production value like you would see in Argo. These are quick. They're done all day long, on the spot. They're not actually even effective if they're too highly polished production. But I think they're compelling and we'll show you how you reach a critical group. But I will also tell you that when you do this kind of work, you need to be respectful, as Shibley would tell you, of cultural norms. You have to understand the narrative of somebody locally that might come from a religious teaching. It might have certain values at stake. And you do have to showcase the lies and the destruction that violent extremism brings down on communities. OK, so how do we know this is all going to work? I mean, what, what measuring, what, how are we possibly going to know if we're moving the meter? Well, I want to confess to you, terrorists are not exactly willing to participate in surveys. So what do you do? You analyze success in some unconventional ways. You see, when you put up one of those videos, people start talking to each other about your video. And when members of Al-Qaeda complain about the CSCC getting on their forums and urge their adherents not to pay attention to us, that's a plus. When a citizen or an official government website suggests 
you know, we ought to start one of these digital outreach teams that match our mission and even our name. That's a game. Okay, so you get done with all your online work, but what about all that offline work? Let's just go back for a second to all those people who are not online in your virtual space. What are you gonna do for people-to-people -people engagement offline? Well, I will tell you that the most important, I think, group that you still have to work with who are not always online are those same young people. Please don't assume that every young person everywhere in the world is glued to their mobile device or their computer. There are currently more than three billion people under the age of 30. What demographers would call a youth bulge. 90% of young, these young people live in developing countries. And please remember that unprecedented numbers of youth are jobless, economically, and politically marginalized. Consider this scale of unmet human need and the stakes in a post-9-11 world <clears throat> where we can't stand by because if we're not engaged with them, you know what's going to happen? those negative factors will lead them in one direction. So we do, through the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, programs that range from educational to teaching English to advising students on how to study in the United States, this land of opportunity and freedom that now houses on a given academic year, 765,000 foreign students at American colleges and universities in the academic year 2011-2012. Wow, 775,000 international students. And you know what? We get a lot of value from having them here. We get to know their values, their insights, their experiences. They bring their cultures and their ideas and their energy. Oh, and also, by the way, they, um, they help our economy. You know how much money foreign students bring into this economy? $22 billion a year. Yeah, some people saying really, B, billion. Be nice to those international students in your dorms. Be very nice to them. It's really not a bad return on the money we spend, given what we spend on foreign aid and diplomacy, which Secretary Kerry will remind you constantly is only 1% of the federal budget. All that little 1%, some of which is going to economic and educational opportunities for marginalized populations, helping people go through transitions in their own countries, helping women and young people in places like Mali, where we fund the training of young citizens who want to become journalists. And we give them smartphones so that they can go out and report their own story. I want you to also remember the importance of your independent voice. You know, everywhere in the world what people want is credibility. They want to be credible. So when we work overseas, we have to be as unobtrusive as we can to identify and support local needs. Support local television stations. Give them the ability to air documentaries or dramas or news specials that might contest propaganda or highlight some positives. You know what also has proven very effective? Telling the stories of families who survive 
terrorism. Putting a human face on the story. We do also engage influential actors. Every society has influential actors. It might be that your professor is an influential actor. It might be a religious leader, an imam, a cultural figure, a peacemaker, a leader of dialogue. So we are always looking for organizations that build those links between critical communities and governments. We fund interfaith projects that link interfaith leaders with their counterparts around the world. Sometimes we invite religious leaders to the US who've never been to the United States. And they have some preconceived notions when they come here. And then we expose them to our religious perspectives, to other Islamic centers, to other pluralistic communities. And you know, at first, some of them are a little dubious. In Yemen, there were some imams that we approached, and they, um, they weren't sure about this whole idea of funding them with English language and training and bringing them here. But we, we encouraged them to try the program. Just give it, give it a chance. And then we noted at a reception recently that 65 imams came forward and said, how do we get more of those scholarships for imams to come to the United States? Many of them would have never engaged, but they saw a few. They liked what they saw. How many of you heard about the innocence of Muslims, kind of incendiary video that angered Islamic communities? An unreported part of that story, because everyone was so focused on the video and its hateful message, that we then moved on and we never really reported back to you on what happened after. Well, it turns out from our research that American ties with imams overseas greatly enhanced our ability to diffuse potential violence in many communities. It was heartening to find out that so many religious leaders and organizations were willing to speak out and condemn violence as a response to offensive speech. Although you might not have read them all, you can find the interfaith statements if you look for them online. They underscore the kind of respect across religious lines that build inclusive relationships instead of narratives of intolerance. You know what we also discovered? Women are powerful change agents. How great to know. So why not engage them in countering violent extremism? They are powerful influencers, not only on their children and families, but they relate to one another across societies. We have to train women in mediation so they can mitigate the violence in their own communities before it starts. We have to also bring the mothers of victims together with the mothers of perpetrators if you really want to change the cycle of revenge. In Pakistan, we've doubled the impact by engaging women, helping a women's interfaith dialogue with women religious leaders. Okay, so let's get now down to, towards the bottom here, you need some numbers. Nothing today is good without numbers. Our embassy in Pakistan has 850,000 Facebook fans. An embassy. And through the Facebook outreach, we can ask people their views on anything and everything we want to know, even on religion. 
And so we asked their views on, in Pakistan on interfaith relations. More than 28,000 fans went on to say something positive. I want you to, to, to know that. You know what they said? We like this forum. Please do more. I don't want you to accept that it's only a negative story. Afghanistan. Also, we are seeing progress and seeing efforts bear fruit. On Secretary Kerry's first day at the office, I had the privilege of escorting him to meet some students who were in the State Department that day from the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. These were kids who'd been living on the streets, selling plastic bottles of water, and they formed an orchestra and toured the United States to standing ovations at the State Department, the Kennedy Center, and ultimately Carnegie Hall. It is an experience I will never forget. And it suggested a certain scenario for Afghans that it's hard to outdo. And that strong counter narrative with that empty vision of destruction against the chords of music and notes. There it is. Okay, so what I want to begin to wind down with is asking you about cost. What is the cost of not doing this? What does it cost if we don't counter negative messaging, offer avenues of positive opportunity, or reach influential voices? I would ask you, are we really going to leave it to our adversaries to define this country, to recruit the disenfranchised, and to make impressionable their cause? And I will be honest with you. I may not be able to draw a straight, perfectly straight cause and effect line between public diplomacy and countering violent extremism. But I will also tell you that the opinion studies and the analytics show promising things that make me believe it's worth a try. In Afghanistan, 69% of those we've asked say they've heard the CVE messaging, and 83% say it's effective. In Pakistan, anti-violence campaigns are showing shifts of positive opinion and an understanding of the impact of terrorism on a community. So we'll continue to survey selected countries and young people and asking them, what has helped change your life? Do you know what many say? Participating in an exchange program or receiving a chance to go overseas. Participating in a community project where I could advocate for my rights and freedoms. Things that give me vision to take back to my community. And this is everywhere. It's in places in Africa where women entrepreneurs tell us that by growing a business or developing a network, they come to influence a government. They like civil society activity, and they want women running for public office. Well, make no mistake, we are locked in the most urgent battle for shared security and futures since the Cold War. What public diplomacy brings to this table is the forging of personal success scenarios and stories. Because when people become deeply invested in their own future, they tend to create more secure futures. And that leads to more secure worlds. 
When you build a more prosperous world out there, opportunity happens for your students, your investors, your traders, your business women, and your entrepreneurs. So I close with my sons still building Legos. They like to make sure, though, that no one is going to knock them down. They want to see a strong foundation, and I want a strong foundation for a shared and secure world. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take some questions. Ah, I did promise you that video, though. Anyone want to see it? Want to see what an online video looks like? Let's do it. أبو رضا الذي أصبح اسمه رمزا لكل من خان قومه من أجل مصلحة خاصة. رسالة الشعب المصري أقول له يا شعب يا مصري كفاية أنا سكوت الإرهاب قتل أولادي وماشيين في الجنازة أنا أدافع عن الملايين استجارت بقربه قراها من ألبان اللقاح الغزائر وأشبعها حتى إذا ما تمل فرته بأنياب لها وأظافر فقل لذوي المعروف هذا جزاء من غدا يصنع المعروف مع غير شاكر tough questions and for me to avoid all of them. We, we are streaming uh, and recording, so in order to be heard, please use the microphone in the center aisle. Uh, thanks for that. And um, we do have about five to ten minutes. Uh, please make sure, given the short amount of time, that there's a question in your question uh, and that you arrive at it relatively quickly. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Secretary. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing this. My name is Camille al Hassani. I'm with Al Jazeera English Television. And I wanted to ask you about um, uh, your, your example of the Legos, how it takes a while to build it up and just a second to knock it down. Um, the U.S. has been engaged in a lot of public diplomacy in the Afghanistan and Pakistan area. And what you hear a lot from the people on the ground is whenever there's a, a drone strike, the opinion of the U.S. goes way down. I wondered if you could address that specifically and how, you know, in, in videos like this, do you, do you produce them in direct relation with drone strikes because that is the a major factor in what a lot of people say is a grievance against the U.S. 
It's a very good question, and I, I think to answer you, I would come at it this way. Every day there are things that happen, and as a journalist, I know we get up in the morning, and you do, and so much goes on in the course of a day that influences what's happening. The thing about public diplomacy that I love is that it, in a sense, has to tune out some of the immediate and focus on the mid and long term. Because if you get caught up in the vicissitudes of the news cycle and, and events, you can never really get beyond it to what people want. And let me be very concrete with you on, on Pakistan and, and the issue of, of drones. I was in Pakistan a few months ago and doing a talk with students and the Q&A started and the first question was, how can we have this public diplomacy with drone strikes? The second question was, how can we have public diplomacy if you're going to come into our country and take out bin Laden? And the questions went from there. And I thought, ooh, this is, this is a hot environment to do public diplomacy in. I, I guess they're really not comfortable with this subject. At the end of the talk, I invited students to come up if they wanted to talk with me in a, a more one-on-one -on -one way, and a line formed across. And each one came up, and they said, despite what we were asking, just want to know how do I I served in Iraq in uh, 2007 um, <clears throat> and uh, was a part of uh, a counterinsurgency uh, mission, which I guess we considered another form of public diplomacy. Um, with the total withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq, uh, we don't hear too much at all about um, U.S. engagement um, uh, policy-wise or anything else. So I'm curious that um, since the withdrawal of the forces, uh, could you kind of uh, go into the, um, the efforts in terms of public diplomacy uh, there, um, if any? Thank you, and first let me thank you for your service. Everywhere we go, we meet people who have served in Iraq, Afghanistan, other places, and we honor and acknowledge the work you've done on behalf of our freedoms. Um, the secretary just made a surprise trip to Baghdad, and I think it was in part to demonstrate that we are engaged and we do care deeply about the Iraqi people and the way this unfolds. Um, I will say to you that I think as we withdraw militarily, and I would put Afghanistan in the same category, the public diplomacy work becomes even more important. It's at that point where you don't have boots on the ground, that you need your eyes and ears, whether it's virtually or physically, and you need those programs, and you need those opportunities. So this is gonna challenge public diplomacy even more in these post-military environments. It's a great question. Hi, I'm a student here at Maryland and in the 
start program as well. And I was just wondering, there are groups that use different community building techniques to also strengthen their stances and their standing in the communities. And how does that complicate your both countering the violence extremism, extremism but also countering their ability to gain a foothold through their outreach initiatives? Give me an example of a local community, of, a, of one you're thinking of as an example of where someone is building in their own way where it might be challenging. Um, I was thinking specifically with the Hamas and Hezbollah groups where they also have a political standing in those. Sure. So part of, of the dilemma, and you rightly point to it, is how do you work in different environments where one group may have a political party or may win an election? How do you work in a place like Iran where you can't even do any real physical engagement? And I think it comes back to the toolbox. You've got to always adapt to your local situation. So for example, on Iran, we can't use some of the same techniques that we might use if you have on the ground exchange programs. So if you don't have an embassy, but actually we do. We have a virtual embassy in Iran. If you go ahead and Google virtual embassy, US virtual embassy in Iran, it's there. And we are reaching people. So I think in certain cases you have groups that are designated terrorists and where we've already said this is somebody that belongs to an extremist group. That doesn't mean we won't go online and engage. That's the new twist. So you have to be willing to go on the video and be engaging with people that you might or might not want to have dinner with. And I've talked to a few uh, officers in the State Department, and it sounds like there are very broad, different definitions that people adopt. And I wonder, you know, it might be a challenge for doing public diplomacy abroad. And I wonder how do you address this issue in working with the employees in the State Department or in the embassies abroad in really shaping a certain view of public diplomacy that would maybe help to uh, be more strategic in how to do those programs. You're absolutely right. It's been, public diplomacy is still a relatively new phenomenon when you think about the history of the United States and how we approach things. So we're, we're still defining the contours of it. And your, your dissertation, I look forward to reading when you're done um, because it will help guide our own thinking. We've done three or four things this year to try to corral all these different impressions. Um, one is to issue an external newsletter called Public Diplomacy in Action, which is essentially taking all the public diplomacy work we do overseas and putting it in a long newsletter and pushing it out of the building. I cannot tell you how difficult it was to get acceptance for taking all this stuff and letting students and practitioners and masters in public diplomacy read it. So it's there and we'll make sure you get a subscription to it. The second thing we realized is it is kind of a messy field in terms of what its core tenants are. So this year we created the first set of public diplomacy leadership tenants, which we will also send you to help the field grapple with what are the core things we're supposed to be doing. The other thing which I do, um, multiple times a day is tweet about public diplomacy. And the Twitter, you know, at first I was sort of, who, who's going to follow a Twitter account on public diplomacy? And we started in May of last year and only three people were following it, my husband and my two sons. Um, <laughs> but now we're up to, Ashley, what? Um, over five, almost over 5,000. Almost 5,500 people who I don't think many of them knew what public diplomacy was. Now we use PD when we go on 
the Twitter people, they've begun to kind of get it. This just the way you might get CT, they get PD. Um, so I think it's a process of educating people, going around the country, going to universities, explaining what this field is, and really trying to build support. The other is the career tracking. We're really working internally now to help people who choose public diplomacy as their cone or course to be able to move more smoothly to positions of leadership. So it's like anything else, peace building, building any field, conflict resolution, public diplomacy, brick by brick, Lego piece by Lego piece, sometimes without that nice manual of instructions. Well, I know I'm meeting with about 20 students and a couple of interviews here, so there'll be more time on campus. I want to thank you all for being such a great audience and for coming today. Thank you, Bill. Again.